The first speaker in the second half of the second session is uh, Zainab, who will be telling us about a physical analysis of quantum circuits using Python. So take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Pelin Yadırım. And today, my colleague Samantha and I are going to present our undergraduate research project, Physical Analysis of Quantum Circuits Using Python. Our colleague Asaf also contributed to the project, which is supervised by Dr. Ilka Ercan. The structure of our presentation is as follows. First, I'll go over our motivation and objective in pursuing this research, why it is important and much needed. Then I'll provide a brief recap of well-known applications that serve as uh, a departure point for our study and then present our work superconducting circuit applications. Later, Samantha will take over and discuss a new center qubits, details of Python analysis, and uh, she will conclude the talk. So the main purpose of our project is to physically examine quantum circuits with Python so that we can have a better understanding about what can we do to improve the circuit and what affects the circuit. After pursuing our analysis at zero Kelvin, we added the temperature term for sp specific su uh, superconducting circuits. We have also analyzed NV sensor qub qubits so that we can compare different kinds of physical qubits. So here we start with two very well studied examples from quantum mechanics. This can be thought of as a departure point for our qubit analysis, as I said. Here we see the plots from Python uh, that created by making the code compute the uh, solution of the Schrodinger equation so that we will be able to analyze any system given that its Hamiltonian is known. We use a very similar algorithm for our circuits too. Then to go beyond the scope of the well-known solutions of the Schrodinger equation of these systems at zero Kelvin, we add the temperature term as perturbation. Using this formulation, we can plot the energy levels uh, in the first row, uh, energy levels of the system with respect to temperature. Also, we can plot the occupation probability of states by using maxwell boltzmann distribution function there in the second row. This will be crucial when determining operating temperatures of a superconducting qubit. But first, uh, let's discuss the superconducting qubits in a broader view. These circuits have pros and cons. The biggest advantage of superconducting qubits is that its manufacturing technology is very similar to today's transistor technology. However, since the circuit is not a real atom, but Rather than artificial atom, the quantum behavior of the circuit will highly depend on the parameters of the circuit and its environment. We can use this circuit only at millikelvin ranges. So here we see the most general case of uh, superconducting qubits. It consists of a capacitor, a Josephson junction, and and inductor. Inductor is not mandatory here. In the absence of inductor, we get a CPB or quantronium or transmon, depending on the ratio between energies of the components. We see that circuit parameters are so important that even when the energy ratio among them changes, the circuit is renamed. So now we move on to some specific circuits. We see the quantronium structure here. It consists of a voltage source, capacitor, and, and Josephson junction, where electrons can tunnel. By the definition of quantronium, the ratio between the energy of Josephson junction and capacitor elements is about 10. Unlike um, usual circuit analysis, we use Hamiltonians uh, to analyze such circuits. And this is the corresponding Hamiltonian of quantron. So our next circuit is fluxonium. Here, in addition to the elements 
in contronium, we have a Josephson junction array. It's here, which behaves as uh, an inductor. To control the circuit, uh, we use external magnetic fields. And its Hamiltonian is also given here. So using these Hamiltonians, we solve the Schrodinger equations for these two circuits, as in infinite square well and harmonic oscillator cases. So we get uh, the corresponding energy levels for circuits. In quantum computing, we only care about the first two energy levels since they represent the two states of binary coding. One needs to be careful about its quantum behavior while designing such a circuit. I mean that the energy levels corresponding to the bits need to be separated. If they touch each other, like it is the case in the upper states, the circuit cannot function as a qubit because the states will not be distinguishable anymore. So as we discussed uh, a couple of slides ago, occupation probability can be expressed with Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function. One can compute the occupation probabilities of states using Python. In other words, uh, we calculate this equation for the first two energy levels. And now we finally see the result of this calculation for the quantronium circuit. The blue line represents uh, the first energy level, the ground level, uh, so it's zero bits. And the orange line represents the second energy level, which is the one bit. We observe that as the temperature increases, the occupation probabilities converge to 50%. This is the most undesired case here, since uh, we cannot encode uh, anything in such a situation. In the first plot, we see that even at uh, about one Kelvin, the probabilities are very close to each other. These plots uh, tell us that at higher temperatures, quantronium circuit is actually useless. So this slide uh, concludes my part of the talk. Thank you for listening. And Samantha will go on now. Um, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, could you go to the next slide or um, can I, um, or shall I? Um, you can take control, I think, or I can. Otherwise, you can uh, just go to the, yeah, I'll let you know to uh, go through. So um, now we will demonstrate uh, the nitrogen vacancy ensemble qubits as a basis of comparison uh, to the superconducting qubits. So, um, um, so here we have the structure. So um, the nitrogen uh, vacancy ensemble is a point effect in a diamond lattice. So that's why we have the carbon atoms around it. And you will see the nitrogen uh, atom with its nuclear spin and the vacancy under it, uh, and there's an electric spin, electron spin. And the uh, NVE can be approximated as a two-level hybrid system. Um, with, so there are four energy levels distinguishable. Um, yeah, and then the state can be combined with the electron spin and a nuclear spin. Uh, and when it changes state, the photon gives off. So this is an NVE implementation um, where you see a diamond nanocrystal and a waveguide um, put next to it, and um, which is um, which uses it for the uh, control pulses to access the control pulses, uh, and then you see the PCB implementation. Uh, yeah. So next slide. So the nitrogen vacancy in some has some nice characteristics, like uh, the electron spin is stable at room temperature, uh, unlike the uh, superconducting qubits, because it needs to be at very cold uh, temperature. Uh, the electron spin is controlled optically. 
Uh, and the nitrogen vacancy center is, as I said, a hybrid quantum system and which has a nuclear spin, which has lo longer coherence, but uh, has harder coupling therefore. Uh, but it is nice for storing quantum information, while the electron spin has shorter coherence, but um, and therefore it's also easier to couple. Um, so that is uh, well suited for sharing quantum information between the spin registers. And the spin uh, is um, there's a spin dependent optical transition, so um, applicable for long distance communication fi via fibers, for example. Um, and um, here, here's a nitrogen um, vacancy ensemble uh, um, single qubit Python application. So these are the energy levels. And as you can see, it's a spin triplet because there are three levels and uh, there's the um, accompanying Hamiltonian. Um, the S components are the spin of the electron and the I components are the nuclear spin. And you can vary the levels by the magnetic field, which is B. Um, and uh, so because there's three energy levels, there are also six electrons involved. OK. And here is an, another Python application uh, with two nitrogen frequency ensembles with uh, coupled to a super conducting coplanar waveguide um, resonator. Um, and uh, here we use the effective Hamiltonian. And uh, the first term is the, Hamil is the interaction Hamiltonian uh, with the two NVEs and um, um, CPWR. The second component is for the coplanar waveguide resonator. And the third component are the two NVEs itself. Um, and in the GK, um, GK is dependent on the rabbi frequency. So by varying the rabbi frequency, you also uh, vary the spacing between the energy levels of it. And that's uh, what I'm plotting here. Um, yeah. And so we use Python for uh, doing the quantum simulations. And because Python is uh, free access and it's a simple language to start with, uh, and uh, there is QZIP on Python, which is an open source software for simulating quantum systems, uh, providing various numerical operations such as finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And the pros are that it's uncomplicated gate commands um, of QTIP, um, the easy access for quantum circuit simulations. Um, there are various open source softwares such as QTIP, QSKIT, and Project Q. And there's online access for IBM's quantum computers uh, via the Qiskit. But the cons are that uh, Python has limited precision um, because with, uh, if you want to do small number calculations. And uh, as the complexity of quantum circuits uh, increase, Python may not be sufficient enough to do the physical analysis. Uh, and to conclude and for further work, um, the analysis we perform bring together physical and mathematical aspect of quantum circuits and therefore present uh, a pedagogic tool as well as exciting research opportunities. Uh, we've illustrated the powerful tools of Python uh, to do uh, effective analysis on the quantum circuits, um, also the energy levels for the nitrogen vacancy ensembles. Uh, our work provides a comprehensive bottom-up discussion on the realization of qubits as well as physical limitations imposed on these systems. And we aim to bridge the gap between education and research aspects of uh, quantum computing by developing accessible computable tools, um, computational tools with higher complexity. Um, yeah, so this was our presentation and thank you for listening. Thank you so much for, for the talk, um, Pauline and uh, Samantha. So we have time for questions. So are there any questions? So I can ask one. So in this talk, the, uh, the qubit architectures that were described were um, first uh, superconducting qubits, and then these are uh, nitrogen vacancy center qubits. So do you plan to do a similar analysis for other types of qubits, for example, trapped ion qubits or photonic qubits, 
or maybe even continuous variable systems? Uh, actually, our uh, current plan is to uh, dive more into these uh, problems. Uh, but uh, in the next steps, we uh, think that we can pursue our research in photonic systems, maybe. Great. Any other questions? So, okay, I'll ask another one. So in this, um, so the kinds of circuits that you analyzed, um, is it possible to do this type of analysis for, to what extent, sorry, to what extent can you, how many qubits can you do your analysis with? Um, well, how, up to how many qubits can you go? Uh, actually, with, uh, if you know the Hamiltonian of the system, uh, you can uh, do the same analysis for every system. But if you have so many qubits, then the Hamiltonian will be so complicated. Uh, so uh, the, the, for, uh, the main task will be to find the Hamiltonian in that case. And when you once find the Hamiltonian, you can uh, do the same analysis. Okay. And do you think that it will change? So. I mean, the more qubits you add, the more interactions there will be between the qubits. And so that will affect the, the quality of the qubits as well, right? And so this is something that and will end up being important when we try to scale up or build bigger quantum computers. Yes, yes, sir. 